Okay, good morning, everyone. So we've been talking about scattering. And last time we had written down what's known as the Lippmann Schwinger equation. Actually, what we'd written down was one version of it. And a lot of today's lecture is going to be translating it into a different version. So this is the version that we had. We have some wave function, which I'm going to call psi plus minus, which is going to describe a scattering state. And it's equal to a plane wave state, k, plus a crazy inverse operator, which looks like this. And then we got worried that maybe that thing's going to, the denominator is going to go to zero. So we regulated it by putting in a plus or minus i epsilon. And then there's the potential, which is different from the H0 Hamiltonian, which is the free particle Hamiltonian in the denominator there. And then we have our scattering state again. OK, so just as a reminder, this k represents the plane wave, the incoming plane wave. Then the psi plus minus is the whole scattering state, including the particles moving away from the scattering region. Okay, and this is the potential that's doing the scattering. Otherwise, the plane wave would just keep going as a plane wave. And then this epsilon here is a real number, but it's also infinitesimal because we didn't really have a reason to put it there except to make sure that our denominator didn't go to zero. And so we'll take it to zero later after we've done a lot of stuff with this equation. Okay, and but even though we're going to take it to zero, the sign of it matters. And so it's either plus or minus. And so I'm writing, I'm going to be writing in lots of the equations today, plus or minus, because only at the very end will we decide that it's the plus sign that we want. Uh, but that will turn out to be um, not, well, it's not obvious from what we've written so far. So plus sign is what we want. Okay, but we'll see why later. Okay, so what we're going to do now is turn this into the position representation. So in the position representation, what we do is we take the matrix element of this expression, representation, uh, with the position eigen eigenbra r, but we're also going to use completeness because that's pretty much what we always do whenever we want to make progress with something. Okay, so we're taking the matrix element with the position eigenstate. So that RK is going to be e to the i k z, because k is going to be in the z direction. Okay, and then what goes here? Now we're going to be using completeness. So I'm going to be integrating over another position, r prime. And so I've got here r, one over e minus Hamiltonian operator, free Hamiltonian operator plus or minus i epsilon r prime, r prime. Okay, and then I've got v and then my scattering wave function again. Okay, so all I've done is put in one in a fancy way by putting in a complete set of states and then integrating over them all. Okay, and now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this matrix element part of it. And notice that that is a function only of r and r prime. It's not a function of the potential. And it's not even a function of the scattering state that we're trying to solve for. So that's convenient. Let's call that thing a function. 
And it turns out to be convenient to factor out 2m over h bar squared. And then the rest of it is some function. And it's going to depend on whether we chose the plus or minus sign. And it's going to depend on r. And it's going to depend on r prime. OK, so that's just a definition of that thing, which is called a green function. OK, and it's uh, a good reason to define it is that it's independent of lots of things. So we can determine it once and for all and then use it for lots of problems. It's independent of the potential. It's even independent of the initial plane wave state. So it doesn't even care that we're sending in particles in the z direction. We could send in particles in any direction. And it's certainly also independent of the scattering state that we're trying to compute. So it's just a mathematically defined thing that we now want to evaluate. OK, so evaluate it. And to evaluate it, we're going to use completeness twice more. OK, and this time we're going to be basically using completeness two times with respect to momentum. So I'm going to write g plus minus r and r prime equals h bar squared over 2m. That just comes from our factor out here. OK, and now I'm going to be integrating over two different wave numbers, q and q prime, wave vectors, I should say. And each one of those is going to correspond to a complete set of states, which I'm going to insert strategically. One of them is going to go there on one side of the inverse operator. And the other one's going to go on the other side of the inverse operator. So here's where the QQ goes. So I've just put in one twice, and then I've got my R prime. So why would we want to do that? What's the clue that we want to use completeness? Basically, the idea is we want to turn this H0 into a number. Right now, it's an operator, but we'd like to turn it into a number. And whenever you see an operator and you're trying to turn it into a number, you want to get it next to its eigenstates. And then you can turn it into its eigenvalue when it's next to its eigenstate. And so that's what we've done. We've put one eigenstate of H0 on one side and one on the other. OK, and so we have used, first of all, the fact that the identity operator is an integral over plane waves times the bra and the cat. And now what we're going to use is that acting on, for example, the Q prime to the left, our H0 evaluates to a number. like that. So it's just, since q is the wave vector, h0 is h bar squared q prime squared over 2m. OK, and so that means that we're just going to be concentrating on this part of the matrix element right now. OK, that becomes, instead of a inverse operator, This is going to be q prime q times 1 over a number now, e minus h bar squared q squared over 2m, plus or minus i epsilon. And that's equal to the three-dimensional delta function 
when I do the matrix element of Q and Q prime over the same number. Okay, and so now, by the way, I remember E is the scattering energy, so it's h bar squared k squared over 2m. And so the problem in the denominator is going to happen to be when q squared and k squared are the same. OK, so that takes care of this part of the green function. Our, our strategy is we're, we're trying to compute this whole greens function integral. And then once we've got that, then we're going to plug it into here. OK, so first for. For the next little bit, we're just going to be um, working on the green function. So to do that, we're also going to use that we know what these wave functions are. So for example, qr is 1 over 2 pi to the 3 halves, e to the minus i q dot r, and r q prime looks almost the same, but it's the complex conjugate and it's the Q prime. Okay, so we're gonna be plugging in those two things. And by the way, the reason why there have to be one over two pi to the three halves here is to get the normalization correct so that this was correct. These states have to be normalized correctly and that was a long time ago in the last semester, that's what we worked out the normalization had to be. Okay, so now if we go back up here, we, we see we have two integrals. One is over Q, one's over, one's over Q prime, one's over Q, and we've got one delta function. So we can do one of those integrals, let's say that Q prime integral, and get rid of the delta function and then just write Q prime equals Q everywhere. And so when you do that, you get that the green function, really it's two green functions because we haven't decided yet whether we want plus or minus, is an integral over the one remaining Q. We've got two, pair, two, two pi to the three halves. So I've written that there. We have an e to the i Q dotted into r minus r prime. That comes from these two things. And then finally, we've got our denominator here. And the denominator is just going to turn into k squared times that minus q squared times that times some h bar squareds over 2m that go away. And so we're left with k squared minus q squared plus or minus i epsilon in the denominator. Okay, so that's what, that's what we've got. We've boiled down to our Green's function into doing that integral, which fortunately turns out to be a doable integral. Okay, so before doing the integral, let, this is a sort of an aside. Uh, so we're going to solve for this integral as an integral, but it's also useful to know that it's a solution to a differential equation, and that's actually the reason for the name green function. So if you act on it with the Laplacian, and by the way, I should tell you what the Laplacian is La Laplacian with respect to, it's derivatives in there with respect to r, not r prime. So this thing just ignores the coordinate r prime, OK, on this. And so the nice thing about that is the only place this thing depends on r is there's an e to the i q dot r. And if we do that in rectangular coordinates, it's just going to bring down a factor of i q squared. Okay, and so the Laplacian of our Green's function, or Green function, is d3q integral over 2 pi cubed 
Okay, and then the Laplacian evaluates to minus Q squared. And then I have the rest of it. And then our denominator is K squared minus Q squared plus or minus I epsilon. And so if I just had a, an additive factor of K squared, I could get rid of that denominator altogether and then I wouldn't have to worry about the I epsilon. So we do that, we just add in K squared to it. And so we get Laplacian plus K squared acting on our green function is this integral, which is a much easier integral, is just e to the i q dot r minus r prime. Denominator is no longer there, so I don't care about the i epsilon or plus or minus i epsilon. In fact, that integral is one of our definitions of the three-dimensional delta function. Okay, and in mathematics, whenever you see a differential equation like that, uh, where some differential operator acting on your unknown function equals a delta function, you call that thing a Green's function. And it's the Green function for this differential operator, which is known as the Helmholtz operator. This operator comes at comes about just in many different areas of physics, including electromagnetism and optics and even acoustics and things like that. Okay, and so in words, what we say is that G plus minus is the green function for the Helmholtz operator. Okay, and terminology aside, it's a solution to a differential equation. So we could, if we wanted to take a different approach and instead of doing it as an integral, we could do it by solving a differential equation, but we won't do that. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and solve it though. Okay, so to evaluate the green function, We're going to do it in spherical coordinates. So our first job is to put D3Q in spherical coordinates. Okay, and so let me rewrite the thing at the top there in that way. So I'm gonna pull out my one over two pi cubed and now if I'm integrating over the spherical coordinate in Q, that's an integral dQ Q squared. And then there's an angular part over phi, which goes zero to two pi. And then there's a part for cos theta. These angles are the angles of the Q vector, not the R vector. And then there's e to the i q, the magnitude, times cosine theta, times r minus r prime, the magnitude. Okay, and then here's our denominator. Okay, and in doing that, I had to choose some coordinate system, and the coordinate system that we chose when doing this is the one where theta and phi, those are the angles of the Q vector, but they're measured from the vector R minus R prime. And that's what allowed us to change the Q dot R minus R prime into just the product of the magnitudes times the cosine of the angle between them. That's what happens when you take a dot product. Okay, and so that's what we've managed to do there. But once we've decided to measure the angles from that as our Z axis, it doesn't matter anymore. We've just got an uh, integral to do here. And so we can next do the angular integrals. One of which is really easy. This one 
Nothing in the integral depends on phi, so that's just going to give us a factor of two pi. And then this one is not so bad either because we're integrating with respect to cosine theta, but all it is is e to the i something times cosine theta. And so that's not so bad. The last integral is going to be a little harder. But doing the angular integrals, we've got it down to this. Okay, so we get an i from the cosine theta integral. What's left over with the twos and pi's is this. Also from the cosine theta integral, we get a one over the distance. And then what's left is an integral just over the magnitude of q. Notice I flipped the sign on it, which change in that denominator, which changes it from plus or minus i epsilon to minus over plus i epsilon. And then there's this stuff. Okay, and that is unfortunately a relatively hard integral, which I'm not gonna do for you, but I'm gonna tell you the answer. So one nice way to express it is to let x be r minus r prime magnitude. And then you can call that whole integral, what does it depend on? It just depends on two things. It depends on uh, x and it depends on k squared. So I'll just write k there. Okay, and then from the method of contour integration, it can be shown. But we will not do it, that that integral is relatively simple. It's i times pi times e to the plus or minus i k x. Okay, and so now we can say what the green function is. Still depending on our choice of, of plus or minus. It's minus one over four pi e to the plus or minus i k r minus r prime over r minus r prime. So notice that our choice of plus or minus somehow snuck out of the denominator. And now it's that choice of plus or minus is actually living up here in the exponential, which is quite consequential. Okay, so we've got the green function and now we need to plug that into, Lit, into Lippmann-Schwinger. So uh, plug into Lippmann-Schwinger. And so now we've got a new version of the Lippmann-Schwinger equation, which looks like this. We had already converted to position space. And now our last term looks like this. Okay, there's an e to the plus or minus i k r minus r prime over four pi r minus r prime. Okay, that was from our green function. And then there was a matrix element involving the potential like so. Okay, so again, this is the incident wave function. We're treating that as known. This is the total or scattering wave function. That's what we'd like to know. Then there's our green function that we do know because it's just a mathematical expression, but then our, over here is our, so all of this is the effect of scattering as part of the total. But unfortunately, the, the effect of scattering still involves the wave function that appears here that we don't know what it is. Oops. 
Okay, so to make progress, we're now going to complete the process of turning this thing into a expression that we can just integrate somehow. So we're evaluating this in position space. This is a matrix element. And we're gonna use completeness one more time. This time we're in a, gonna be integrating over yet another position, our double prime. And here's where we're gonna put in the complete set of states. Okay, and now the good thing about this is because V only depends on position, this is equal to the number V as a function of R prime rather than the operator times a three dimensional delta function, which is good news because that's going to make it possible to do the integral. Okay, and this is nothing other than the wave function for psi plus minus evaluated at R double prime. Right, and so now we do the integral, we get rid of the delta function, we change our double prime here and here into our prime. Okay, and so this is equal to, maybe I should just put it up here, V of R prime, psi plus or minus of R prime. And so now our wave function looks like this. This is our plane wave. And now we still have an integral to do d3r prime. Here's the part from our green function. And then there's the potential. And then there's our wave function again. Okay, so this is still the Lippmann Schwinger equation. It's just basically instead of written in terms of kets, we've written it, rewritten it in terms of wave functions and figured out how the green function comes into that. All right, so now what are we going to do with it? This is so far exact, and now is where we're going to start making approximations. So specifically, we're going to specialize this to points that are very far away from our scattering. Because if we have a detector somewhere to detect the particles, we're probably not going to want our detector sitting right in the beam, so it's somewhere far away. Okay, and so it's going to be very far away from points R prime in the integral where the potential is large. Okay, so here's the picture. Here's our region where the potential lives. When we're doing this integral, we're integrating over R prime, but if we're requiring the potential to be significant there, that means we're within some region here. Okay, so there's our R prime. And then far away is where our detector is. This is the vector R. And so we want the magnitude of R to be much, much larger than R prime. And that means we can approximate R minus R prime in magnitude. First of all, just using the dot product of those two things. Let me call this angle, let me call it alpha just temporarily. Okay, and so this is r times square root of one minus two r prime over r, cosine alpha plus dot dot dot. The idea is we're neglecting the r prime squared and whatever else we get under the square root. And so if you expand that for small r prime, this is r minus r prime 
times the cosine of that angle, which is otherwise known as the magnitude of R minus a little bit, which is the dot product of the direction vector to the observer dotted into the vector that's describing where the potential is. Right, so this is all approximations. I should be writing plus dot, dot, dot here. But this is the main thing. This is saying when you're super far away, the main thing that matters is just how far away you are from the origin. And then there's a little correction term that depends on where you are as you wander around inside the potential. That's the little correction term. Okay, so at this point, it's useful to define a vector k prime, which has the same magnitude as k, except instead of pointing in the z hat direction, it points in the r hat direction. So same magnitude as incoming, but directed away from the scatter ring region. which is the r hat direction. Okay, so now we're gonna take this approximation that we did and plug it into here. And so specifically for the exponential, e to the plus or minus i k r minus r prime is approximately, the main part of it is just e to the plus or minus i k r. And then the correction part of it is e to the minus over plus i k prime dot r prime. Okay, so I should put approximately equal to here. This is all in the large r limit. Okay, and then in the denominator here, this, we can just get away with calling that one over R. Okay, because that's the leading behavior in large R. So to summarize what we've got, here's our total wave function. It's got a plane wave part. This is the wave that we send in. And then there's minus one over four pi, two m over h bar squared. And now the thing is we can take this thing, this thing doesn't depend on our prime. And so we can pull it all the way out of the integral. Sorry, this should be e to the plus or minus i k r over r. And then everything else depends on r prime, so we need to keep it within the r prime integral. There's an e to the minus i k prime dot r prime. Okay, and there's our potential v of r prime. And then there's our wave function again, which also depends on r prime. Okay, so I, I wanna emphasize that up to a few minutes ago, back up here, this was an exact equation. And now we've taken the limit where we're very far away. Okay, so this is only for large r. Okay, but, but a, a couple of lectures ago, we asked, for we tried to guess what the wave function was going to look like very far away. And this is exactly what we had guessed because, well, I knew the answer in advance. So it has this part to it. And then it has an e to the i k r over r part to it. And then you may remember that the rest of it that was multiplying that was something we called f k. And so this thing has to be that f sub k. Okay, furthermore, if we think about what should this thing look like, it should be e to the i k r and not e to the minus i k r. 
as this says. So that one factor is an outgoing wave. Oops. This is an outgoing wave for plus sign. And it's an incoming wave for the minus sign. And that's telling us why we should choose the plus sign. So they're both mathematically valid solutions. Mathematically, there's nothing wrong with choosing plus or minus here. You can plug this thing into the Schrodinger equation and they both work for large R. But if it was an incoming wave, that would be pretty weird. That would be saying, we have this plane wave and then we have these incoming spherical waves that are converging on the, the target in just such a magical way as to converge there and then match onto our plane wave. So that's mathematically valid, but it's not what we do in physics. In physics, we send in a plane wave and we watch the spherical waves coming out. We watch the scattered particles coming out. Okay, so to summarize that, these are both valid solutions mathematically. But because we're doing physics, we want the plus sign. All right, and this plus sign started off its life as just multiplying an infinitesimal thing, but now it's making this big decision of whether the, the waves are coming in or out. Okay, and the reason is because in real life, the scattered waves are moving away from the target, not towards the target. Okay, so the, I mean, the picture here is there are wave fronts moving in, there's our little target, and then out come these waves going away. Okay, and that the phase of that wave is k, dot, k prime dot r, which is otherwise known as k times r because somewhere up here, we defined k prime to be in the r hat direction. Okay, and so what we've learned is that the physically relevant solution has the following form, just as predicted. Okay, there's a psi, and now that I know it's a plus sign, I'm not gonna bother putting plus or minus anymore. Okay, it's, one over two pi to the three halves, e to the i k z plus e to the plus i k r over r times something, which we earlier agreed to call f sub k. It's a function of the angle at which the wave at which you're observing the wave. And now we know what that f sub k is. Remember, we called that the scattering amplitude. Okay, and it's just all of this stuff, but also including this stuff. Okay, so that's equal to minus m over two pi h bar squared. There's a factor of two pi to the three halves power. That's just to compensate this thing that we pulled out. And then there's an integral to do, d3r prime. And we have an exponential. That's a prime. And then we have a potential. Of course, it has to involve the potential, otherwise there wouldn't be any scattering. And then there's the psi function again which I guess I said I wasn't gonna put the plus sign on because we already know it's a plus sign. Good, so now we've accomplished our task of proving that it really does have the form that we claimed it did. Okay, and remember F sub K, if we square it, just gives the differential cross section, which is what you actually measure. 
The problem is though, that even though we've got it, we've got an expression for it, we don't have a solution yet. So this is not a solution. And the reason it's not a solution is right now it's sort of circular logic. If we want the wave function, we need the scattering amplitude, but to get the scattering amplitude, we need the wave function. So it's a consistency thing. It's something that we still have to solve. Uh, basically, psi still appears on both sides. Okay, and this is a, what's known as an integral equation as opposed to a differential equation. And sometimes you can solve this thing exactly, but in general, you have to solve it in approximation. And so much of the next few lectures are going to be different approximations and or tricks that we can use to go ahead and evaluate this thing, uh, this scattering amplitude uh, without, um, hopefully without making too much of, of an error in doing so. Okay, any questions so far on, on the strategy that we've got here? So one thing I should mention is I'm, I'm going to be not exactly following the order in the notes, partly just for variety. It, I think maybe a good idea to see things from slightly different angles at times. So you'll, you, if you're following the notes, you'll notice that I'm not gonna be quite going in the same order. What part of the notes was this from? Uh, well, if I had my notes in front of me, I could tell you, let's see. Um, and bring that up. We are roughly in, uh, let's see here. So we're roughly around uh, equation 17.4.30, except that now what we're going to do uh, for variety is I'm going to skip ahead slightly to um, the beginning of 17.6, and then we'll go back to where we were. Okay, so in fact, I'm gonna skip ahead to one very simple case, one very simple approximation that we can use to solve these equations. And that's the Born approximation. named after Max Born. Okay, and so the idea here is we're, we'd like to just do this integral. The problem is it depends on psi and we don't have an expression for psi yet, but maybe the scattering is sufficiently weak that if we took this psi and just forgot about this term, which is the scattering term and said, um, the wave function's mostly in the, in the beam, right? So if the wave function's mostly beam rather than scattering, then we can just plug in the beam here and we know what the beam is because we sent that in. It's this part, and then we can do the integral. And so that's an approximation and we'll discuss corrections to that approximation a little bit later. But so that's the idea. If the scattering is, is weak enough, And specifically, what we need to worry about it being weak enough is inside the target. So if the scattering inside the target is, let me say, not too strong, then we can just approximate our wave function as just one over two pi to the three halves, e to the i, k dot r prime. Okay, remember k 
is in the z hat direction. So we know exactly what that is. And now we plug this in. And now we've got our scattering amplitude. F sub k of theta and phi is equal to minus m over two pi h bars squared. Notice that's, by the way, why I kept the two pi to the three halves separately is because in the Born approximation, now it's just going to cancel against that one over two pi to the three halves. And then what's left over is an integral. And everything in the integral is now in principle known. Okay, there's an e to the i k minus k prime dotted into r prime. r prime's our integration variable. And then the only thing left in there is the potential, which we presumably know what the potential is. Okay, and that's it. That's our expression for the scattering amplitude. All we have to do is somehow do this integral, which by the way, is a three-dimensional Fourier transform of the target potential. Okay, and so again, just to make everything complete in one place, recall k is equal to k times z hat k prime is equal to k times r hat. That's the wave moving away from the origin. And they're both related to the energy. The energy of the particles we're sending in is h bar squared k squared over 2m. OK, and we do that integral. That integral, if we do it correctly, should have units of length. And then the differential cross-section that we actually want is just the complex square of that thing. So these make great homework problems and even great test problems. For example, on your next homework set, which is the next to last one of the semester and is now on the web page, uh, one problem is I'm going to give you a potential and ask you to find the differential cross section in the Born approximation. And so now you know that all you have to do is do this integral. All right, so it's a little bit early today, but this is actually a good, a good breaking point. So next time what we'll do is we'll do some examples of the Born approximation. And then from there, we'll move and, and talk a little bit about how to interpret the results. And then we'll move on to figure out how to go beyond the Born approximation, uh, which I think was also worked out by Born. But there's a very nice, elegant way of, of describing that in terms of diagrams, where you sort of draw a picture, and each part of the picture corresponds to a formula. It's sort of like what in, what in particle physics is known as Feynman diagrams. Um, but so we'll go over that. Uh, I guess one other thing I can say about the homework is uh, I know some of you were struggling to turn it in a little bit uh, this week. I don't really wanna be a stickler for the rest of the semester about late penalties. I, I do think that I should probably still have some late penalty because some people uh, did, did work harder to turn it in on time. But if you, did, if you didn't turn it in on time or you're um, not so happy with, uh, with how much of it you were willing to, you were able to compute, then I'll make the late penalty half what it was. So 5% per day rather than 10% as long as you turn it in by Saturday at midnight. So you can, if you turned it in already, you can choose to retract it and turn in a slightly enhanced version if you feel like it or you can just move forward and, and deal with the next homework set, which is due a week from today. But there I'm gonna have a similar deal. In fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say right now that even though it's due a week from yesterday, I won't charge a late penalty if you turn it in on Saturday. And so I know some of you have said, well, we don't wanna work on Friday night. And so I'm saying, too bad. I'm giving you the option of working on Friday night if you want. You can take it if you want, or you can not take it if you don't want. 
okay? And then, so there will be one more homework set after the one that's on the web page today. That will be the one that will be due on the reading day. And I will attempt to make that a little bit shorter than usual, but we will see if I succeed. Okay, so that's it for today. Any any questions on today's lecture that I can answer? Professor, you mentioned you'd go over the bonus question and the midterm. Oh, yeah. And now I've gone over time. So, okay, I promise I will do that. I will do that uh, on Monday um, for sure. But it's, it's basically very simple. If you're, if you're um, in the, uh, if you're a boson, you can put as many bosons as you want in the lowest state, in the lowest state. That's really all there is to that problem. And so all of the bosons go into the ground state with the minimal value of energy and the minimal value of angular momentum. And so the, uh, unlike for fermions where we put electrons into states, but we have to make sure we don't put two electrons in the same state, in that problem, all the boson, all the, uh, what did I call it? The weird electrons, which are bosons, just all, they all go into the ground state orbital. So that was really all there was to that problem. So basically like we weren't supposed to have the 2s and 2p and all of that. They were all supposed to be in the 1s, correct? Yeah, that's basically correct. Yep. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Yeah, that's a big difference between bosons and fermions. So the world is a very different place because electrons are fermions than it would be if it would be extremely weird if boson if electrons were bosons because then you would just pack all the ground state would just be packing everything into the lowest orbital. Yes. Um yeah, I also arrived late, so I kind of ran out of time, but I didn't get to finish the last part of problem three. Could you briefly go over that as well? The last part of problem three. Um, wait, you're, which homework set are you talking about? I'm talking about the midterm, the midterm. Oh, midterm. Oh, gosh, I don't even know the midterm yes. I'm up here. Uh, where is it? Sorry, I have to find the midterm, which isn't on my desktop. Here, let me let me stop the recording at least.